Sunday. Today is a Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Wouldn't you know that? Isn't that great? Let's appreciate it. We have something to celebrate today, and I hope you have signed the card out in the front and uh, take a little money out of, oh no, put the little money in the offering plate for him. But we also have a little token of our appreciation. Yeah, the cards are for the end of the month, through the end of the month, so you can give more as the month goes by. But we'd like to have them come up, please, both of them, please, one after the other. I know it's a long way to walk. And Pastor Joe, we know since you can't have candy, we thought we'd, we probably should have got you fruit too, but. I'll share with you, brother. Okay. Yes. Oh, so good. yes. This is awesome. You, you might have to share that a little bit, but <laughs> we tried to get fruits that you don't always have, so. We heard that the pastor needs sweetening up, <laughs> <laughs> so we got him a, a bouquet of candy. So we want to show how sweet he really is. Yeah, way better. Amen. Way better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh. Oh. Yeah. We're so glad that God has put you both in our path. Thank you for being here. Yeah, you're very welcome. My privilege. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what would. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my word. As you all remember, I was raised in an island, the Dominican Republic, the Caribbean. If uh, any of you guys don't remember where that island is, if you know where Puerto Rico is, which is which is U.S. territory, um, is on the west side of Puerto Rico. And uh, you probably have heard about Haiti also. So Haiti and Dominican Republic, they share the same island. It's only divided by a border. Haiti is on the west side of the country, and east side is Dominican Republic, what is being called La Hispaniola. Thank you for being over here. It is a blessing. It is a blessing to have you with us so we can have fellowship, so we can worship the one and true God. Amen? Amen. Welcome. You at home, thank you for being faithful and watching the service through the internet. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We're here today to discover why one of the, mo one of the most powerful kings on earth admitted that he was infected with the deadly and more destructive virus on earth. But we're also here to discover what is the cure and the power that can prevent and save us from it. So today, we we'll all will learn who has the cure. I'm not going to tell you the name of that person. He will. Are you ready? Are you ready? Say amen. amen. Praise God. Pastor? Good morning. Oh. Good morning. <laughs> good. Just a tiny bit hot there, CJ. <laughs> yes, good to see you. There was... A lot, a lot going on. Hey, Chad, I, I turn around, there's all these people here. Um, a lot going on. You've probably been watching the news or, or social media or something regarding uh, the uptick in the cases regarding COVID-19. Um, I don't know. The word that sticks with me is uh, pandemic fatigue. Pandemic fatigue. That's, that's where I am. That's where many of you are that I've talked to about. Uh, it's hard. It's hard. We're, 
we're going to do our best. Uh, we're going to be open as much as we can. We've, you know, started asking with masks again. It's, it's hard. We're, we're all just tired of it. We're all tired of it. Um, so our COVID restrictions and changes continue. Some things are the same. You know, when the doors go shut, that is this symbol that it's us and God now. It's all those things that we fought all week long with other people and with other topics and with other stresses that we struggled with all week long. We're going to do our best to block those out to hear what God has to say for this next 45 minutes or so. And, and that's hard because of pandemic fatigue, because of the things that we bring in. Um, our, our order of service is different. We don't have Bibles in the pews. We don't have offering plate that we're going to pass around. The offering plates at the back for any offerings that come in, the back or outside or both. Uh, we don't, you know, meet and greet like we normally would. It's just things are just strange and they're different and they've been different for now for months now and we're just getting tired of it. Uh, we do have a few prayers and praises to mention this week. Um, all of our prayer time, or the majority of our prayer time, is together. Hey, Paisley. Um, it's together, where we talk about our prayers and praises, we, we pray for the message, and we, and we close with the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is in the inside of your bulletin, because there's different translations of that. So we'll, we'll close this prayer with a copy, of, or by reciting the Lord's Prayer. So we're trying to maintain some consistency, but at the same time, uh, we, we understand the stresses that are out there. Um, the prayer request so, so far, it's different than last week, quite a bit different. Uh, we still have Dennis Dunker. He's going in for knee surgery very quickly. He got measured for his knee, I think it was last Wednesday, and he's going in in the next week or two to have that operated on. Uh, we want to maintain our, our health, and so he's not here this morning, things like that. Uh, keep my mom lifted up in prayer. Nothing really new. She's had uh, heart issues for a decade or more. Um, but with the dry weather, the allergies, the stress of the virus, all those things, it seems to have an effect on her. Uh, she was very short of breath when I talked to her this morning, or this morning, a couple days ago. Uh, keep Joe Bettner and Lillian and the family lifted up in prayer. Just keep, keep them in your prayers. And then we have a ton of praises, a, a ton. And, and we probably have these praises all the time. I just forget to mention those. Uh, some of them are a lot of fun. Bob hates getting praised, so I'll go ahead and mention Bob. Um, not just the normal stuff. Uh, Joe was gone at a pastor's conference this last week, so or this last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so Bob filled in with Bible study. Um, Wednesday, we had a life, screen, a life screening event here that there was 60 to 70, I suppose, came through throughout the course of the day. Bob helped with that. He was here before I got here. Um, Boy, Wednesday morning, he was here before 8.30-ish, and he was still here after men's group at after 9 o'clock Wednesday night, <laughs> all day. Much of the carpet cleaning in our entryway and the hallway going to the fellowship hall, fellowship room, the fellowship room. Um, I don't know how many hours Bob sent, spent cleaning carpet this week. Um, he would probably fib about it. I would guess it's north of 20 hours of just working on that with no praise. He'll grumble that I mentioned him. Uh, and just to know that he does a lot of those things, and other people do tons of those things too. Pat Moore works hard in Sunday school. Uh, Pat Moore, Moore works on mission board work. All these things that we see throughout the course of the week and the worship team that comes up and the sound people, um, all of that, we, we never want to forget you, but at the same time we understand there's kind of this silent recognition thing going on. So, uh, Please, no, we, we thank you, and I would like to just thank all of them for their work right now as we clap. So, so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, and two other quick ones. We want just praises, uh, both Marty Carlson and also Eric and Kylie. They traveled some last week. They're all home safely. That's good. We like, like that you're, you're back here. Uh, and I had Bob do some investigating. If any of you have seen the, the logo shirts that we have, we have a First Baptist Church logo shirt with kind of the heart or the swirl on it, the uh, trans, yeah, that one there, Reflecting Love, Transforming Lives, that dealy. Um, Bob has some, Joe has some, I have some. Several have asked about pricing for that. And with the logo, um, short sleeve, or excuse me, t-shirts are $12, polo shirts, nope, polo shirts are 22 
long sleeve or excuse me short sleeve button up shirt button down collar or 22 long sleeves or 24 and the colors are whatever you can find under the rainbow pretty much the catalog is a couple inches thick as far as colors so and styles and that so just know that if you do want a shirt uh, we're going to be ordering some um, and again from t-shirts to long sleeve button down shirts 12 to 24 bucks and that includes the logo and, and everything so um, that's that's what we we have there so far now back to church <laughs> yeah so let's open in prayer and again, we're going to close this prayer with the Lord's Prayer that's, that's on the back. There'll be a pause before we say amen with the Lord's Prayer. Uh, so for those of you who have heard that before, it's common. But for those of you who are new, we have guests here today also. There'll be a pause before we say amen. So let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. And ask forgiveness for not thanking you enough. Thank you for our ability to walk and talk and swallow. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for a safe place to worship. Thank you that we can worship you at all without being continually persecuted, physically persecuted, not just ridiculed, but shot at, persecuted. This church has not been firebombed. We have access to your word and your words. Lord, you give us so much. And we grumble a lot, typically. I do, anyway. And Lord, so we ask that you would forgive us for those things that we do not understand or those things that we've taken for granted. That you would hear each of those prayers that we're, we lifted up and that each and every heart in here lifts up in their own way, in their own version, in their own prayer, spoken or unspoken. We all struggle with something. Every one of us that walk through this door and so many that are outside of those doors. Lord, be with those. Be with the wedding that occurred yesterday and last night. And, and just be with all those who seek Your face. Be with all of those who desperately need to hear Your Word and Your words. And Lord, that You would open up our minds and our ears and our hearts to what You have to say and that each and every one around this wor world who speaks Your Word and Your words would speak them with clarity and with boldness and with accuracy. As we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for the sound of little children. I, don't, I couldn't tell if that was Georgia or... Or must be honest group. Good. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> she, she secretly pointed out Georgia. <laughs> so thank you for the sound of little children. That was um, somebody to approach. It's almost every week when I'll hear some version of this. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that the kids were a distraction in church. I'm so sorry that the, the kids made noise. I'm so sorry that you, I couldn't, you know, you probably couldn't even hear what you were saying because of the kids. Um, thank you for that that expression um you never have to say it to me ever again it, it was i love it love it love it love it just make noise as, as anything like that we'll work around the kids we'll always work around the kids so thank you for that um we've been in a, a sermon series this old you know learning knowing the god of the old testament and a god who created and then we get into this this section where it's a psalm of david but there was so many paths that crossed through it, it could have been a lot of different scriptures. Uh, there's a lot of scriptures today. On the back, there's an outline in your, in your bulletin. On the front, there's going to be a few fill-in-the-blanks. On the back, there's a slug of scriptures, all that I could put on there. They're not all on there. Uh, most of them are this week. Last week, we only had about two-thirds. But a lot of them are, are just in passing, so a lot of scriptures could have been used. This topic of 
create in me. Essentially, David is asking God to create in him a, a new heart, or he's going to be. And right now, he's asking God to restore him. We talked about how David saw his sin and how, how horrible sin was in David's eyes. He called it three different things. Transgressions, which is a willful defiance. He willfully defied God. Iniquity that David saw his, his willful defiance against God as perverse. It was uh, yucky. It was perverse. It was stained. And that David saw his sin as he was guilty. Plain and simple. He was guilty of his sin. So we saw those things. And last week we talked about God's justice and God's judgment. And this week we're going to talk about what it means to repent and when David came to God, and, and the verses are going to start coming a little bit quicker as we work through this, but when David said, you know, Lord, I, I repent of these things. I want you to restore me, and we're going to walk through it that way. So and if you have a Bible with you, wonderful. If you don't, uh, that's fine. But if you do have one with you, I would invite you to open up to the Psalms. Uh, it's almost to the middle of your Bible, just a little bit short of middle. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 51. So Psalm 51, it'll be the first five verses, which I will read and would invite you to stand as you are able to out of reverence for God's Word. Psalm 51, the introduction says, For the director of music, a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know that my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You may be seated. And if you've been here before, you, you notice a, an acceleration or a crescendo type to this message. And, and there is, and it's going to keep coming that way. And it's going to keep building and keep building because that's, that's where we are. Um, I started making a, a slight change to our outline just to kind of keep the points a little bit closer together. So on your outline, if you look, there's going to be three, three main headings. Infected, inclined, and implored infected, inclined, and implored, implored. And there'll be, there'll be a fill-in-the-blank or two in each one. There, all there is is a few blanks. There's not a lot or anything like that, but would encourage you to take notes. Um, there's a lot in this message. There, there's just a lot in this message. Uh, Joe's had, had a few, few days to, to work through it, and, and he's, there's a lot in here. So uh, this first point of infected, we're going to kind of focus on this verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, David is saying that we are all infected with sin. We're all infected with it. We can't get rid of it. We were born with it. He was sinful at birth, he says. We, we, achieve, or we acquired it from our parents who acquired it from their parents who acquired it from Adam and Eve. They, we've, we've all got it, and we can't get away from it. We all have this sinful nature that is part of who we are, and no matter how hard we try, we can't, we can't release it. We can't grow out of it in any way. And the first fill in the blank, first fill in the blank, is having a sinful nature is not something we can avoid or grow out of. Having a sinful nature is not something that we can avoid or grow out of. It's, it's never something, no matter who, how great we are. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, if we think, oh, I'm going to talk about a power Christian. The Apostle Paul, he'd be a power Christian. He, he, he could do no wrong. <laughs> Romans chapter 7, written by the Apostle Paul, says, Paul writing, I do not understand the things that I do. I do not do what I want to do, and I do the things I hate. I do not do the good things I want to do, but the bad things I do not want to do. It is sin living in me that does these things. That's the Apostle Paul. So if you're feeling like you're having a hard time struggling with it, welcome to the club. Because the Apostle Paul's there too. He couldn't get out of it. He couldn't get away from it. David is saying, and let's hear this. This is a commentator's words, but I don't want to mess it up. David is saying, God forgive me not only for my sins and for being a sinner, but also forgive me for being born with an inclination toward my sin. 
our, and my inability or our inability. God, forgive me for my inability to resist sin. I don't know why I've never heard it like that before, but it sort of struck a chord in me. I thought, whoa, yeah, I, no, I'm there, Paul. I, I resist. I'm trying to, but I fall down. I fall down. I fall down, and I get beat up by the evil one who says, why are you keep falling down? Well, Paul fell down. Adrian Rogers is a, a Baptist preacher. Um, I couldn't remember when he died, so I looked it up. Adrian Rogers, Baptist preacher, passed away in November of 2005. So he's been gone for almost 15 years. Listen to his words from 15 years ago, at least 15 years ago, because this was written before he died. Adrian Rogers writes, Today we have almost done away with the idea of sin. Our culture rejects sin as old-fashioned, so much so that we have taken away the word sin and replaced the word sin with new words and phrases like error, mistake, misjudgment, weakness, psychological maladjustment, glandular malfunction, and a stumble upward, anything but the word sin. We've gone through the medicine cabinet and put new labels on old bottles of poison. We have new terminology. We've tried to change things by changing the words, but our sinful nature has not really been changed at all. Nothing has changed except for how we see ourselves. We are lying to ourselves and lying to a holy God. We must come back to the place of accountability. People do wrong because we are wrong. End quote. Oh, wow! <laughs> that sounds so today. Uh, that's... That's perfect. That's perfect. So I read it word for word pretty much. Andy Stanley, uh, our men's group was in a study, I don't know, feels like 100 years ago. It's probably last fall. But <laughs> we were in a study, and Andy Stanley, part of that study, he says, we are not mistakers. We've changed sin to say that it was a mistake. And Andy's like, no, we're not mistakers. We're sinners. We're sinners. sinners. Sin is more than a mistake. A mistake is something you can learn to avoid. A mistake is something you can, you can grow out of. A mistake is something that you can be different from later. Sin's not like that. Sin doesn't work like that. I thought, oh boy, that's, that's something. And that sin is part of who we are that Andy would stay, say and Adrian would say and Paul would say. So would Peter. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You know that in the past you were living in a worthless way, a way passed down from the people who lived before you. But you were saved from that useless life. You were bought not, at, not with something that ruins like gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Yeah, we were, we were bought at a price even though we can't get out of sin. Now Martin Luther, long, long, long time before that, after Paul, but before Adrian Rogers, Martin Luther says, my whole life is evil. He reformed the Lutheran church. And he writes, my whole life is evil. Martin Luther. I cannot boast of merit or of righteousness, he writes. But I am evil altogether. It is my character. I do evil. I have sinned. I do sin and shall sin to the end of the chapter. <laughs> it doesn't leave a lot out. <laughs> End quote from Martin Luther. Like, huh, well, how do we get past it? Commentator chimes in on Martin Luther and says, sin, and that's where Joe, and Joe constructed that virus, is the most destructive, the most destructive and the most deadly virus this earth has ever known is sin. Because it's been forever. It's not just a pandemic now. It's been that way since Adam and Eve. It's been killing people since then. It's always been there. And the only cure the only cure for that is the blood of Jesus Christ because he's the only one that can cover it over, can wash it away, can atone for it as we did a couple Sundays ago. He's the only one that can pay this tetelestai. He's the only one that can pay for that debt because the payment for death is the death of this penitent payment for sin is the death of the sinner. This commentator wrote one, one sentence I want you to absorb. The only sin that we'll refuse to leave is the sin that we refuse to leave. The only sin that will refuse to leave you is the sin that you refuse to leave. Uh, oh boy. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. It, it just it steps on every aspect of every part of me. Sir Charles Spurgeon, another older ago, Charles Spurgeon writes, whether the bill be little or great, the same receipt can satisfy one as the other. 
in Jesus, in Jesus, our iniquity is gone. It's gone all at once and all gone forever. Sins against the holy God. Sins against his righteous laws. Sins against his love. Sins against his blood. Sins against his name. Sins against his cause. Sins as immense as the sea. From them he cleanseth me. C.H. Spurgeon writes, and he gets that, I think, from 1 John 1, that says, if we live in the light as God is in the light, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. Whoo, hallelujah. Because it gets kind of desperate feeling when you get sucked down into the vortex of thinking about sin without some sort of escape clause. That's perfect. Now, the second point, and I'm going to try to keep these together. So the second point, the first one is that David realized that he was infected with sin. We, we got it. Now, the second point is David is inclined. He's inclined to ask God to take it away. The, the story of David is, is so much more vast than we can cover in one message. Because if you ask the Sunday school, if you ask Paisley about David, well, David and Goliath, David and the giant, David threw the stone, David killed Goliath. And we get more adult, we're like, well, yeah, David carried his head around for a while too after that. And then David did all these things, and he was mad at David, Nabal, and then David got to be king, and then he's chased around by Saul, and then he's really king. And then, so David's story just kind of keeps unraveling like that until we get to this time of David sinned, and he needs it to find his way back. So he is inclined to ask God to take his sin away. Repentance is not only turning away from sin. We, we've probably heard that. Many of you have heard that before. Oh, repent is just a, a change of mind. Repent is turning away from your sin. It's more than that. Repentance is turning away from your sin, but it's turning to God. If you don't turn to God after you turn away from your sin, you're just going to go back to sin. It's too strong. We remember it's in us. It's with us. We can't get away from it. So you, you're, you turn away from sin, but then you have to turn God in the middle of that. The topic of repentance, I didn't realize this, the topic of repentance is mentioned 60 times in the New Testament alone. 60 60 times in the New Testament. It's uh, the Gospel of Mark, the very first words of recorded by Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, which most believe is the first Gospel written. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, 14 and 15, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, saying, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news first thing. Same thing with the, uh, John the Baptist. In John 3, he's going to be talking the same thing. Repent. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is near. For the, this gets a little sharp. For, for the man or the woman, boy or girl, the man or the woman who has not repented of their sin yet, who, who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who doesn't really know much about Jesus, and, they, and they've been to church, but they are kind of drug kicking and screaming like I was until I was about 35. And that, you know, they, they know about Jesus, but they don't really know about the relationship with Jesus part. Saying you need to repent of your sins and turn to Jesus is, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sound hollow. It's going to sound shallow. It's going to sound weak. So, they, the, one of the commentators says, well, it's more practical to ask the question, what do you do with your guilt? What do you do with your guilt? What do you do with the bad things you've said and done and thought? What do you do with those things? I mean, you can talk about repentance and it can sound shallow, but if you don't know where you're going with those things, then it gets real all of a sudden. Well, how, how are you going to get clear of that? Because we've all done bad stuff. So how are you going to get how are you going to get clear of that? How are you going to change? And along comes a verse like John 14, 6. And Jesus tells Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way. I'm the one you go to. I'm the one you look to with those questions that you can't find your way out of. I'm where you go. We are, we are not any more better. We're not any more sufficient. Sophisticated. I don't even know that we're that much smarter than King David was. We have more tools now. We have the internet now. We have things like that. We have the printing press and stuff. But our sin is just as bad as his sin. Whether we paint it with adultery or something else, our sin is a sin is a sin. The idea that, that sins get big and little, that's a human idea. That's not a Bible idea. Sin is a sin is a sin is a sin. They all equal death. There's no, no way around it. Uh, the few scriptures, there's a bunch of them. I'm not going to read them all. There's a bunch of them. One in Matthew chapter 5. This is Jesus. It's the Sermon on the Mount. 
and he's talking to the people, and he's comparing, because those people would have known the Old Testament really good. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. They would have, they would have had the Old Testament down pat. So Jesus is talking to them in this, it's verses 21 to 48, but I got it all squished down. So verse 21, Jesus speaking, you have heard it said, you must not murder anyone, but if you call someone a fool, you will be in the danger, danger of the fire of hell. And he goes on, you have heard it said, you must not be guilty of adultery, but I tell you, if anyone looks at a woman and wants to sin sexually with her, in his mind, he has already done that sin with the woman. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who hurt you. If you do this, you will be true children of your Father in heaven. You must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get there. I can't drive by that building on the street. I can't even get over somewhere close to perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not close to that. It's the Old Testament that they would have known that says in Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all else. It's sick. It's broken. Romans 3.23, all have sinned, not some, all have sinned. Romans 6.23, the wages for sin is death. There's no compromise. There's no little sin. There's no bigger sin. There's no dead sin. It's all dead sin, all of it. That fill in the blank, CJ or, or Joe? In God's eyes, the only acceptable payment for any and all sin is the death of the sinner. The only acceptable payment for any and all sin is the death of the sinner. No one is good. No one can get to heaven on their own works or their own goodness. We can't get there. And David knew that. Repentance is this not just turning away, but you turn to God to cover the bad stuff. And the last point, this last point, David said he was infected with sin and he implored God to take it away or he inclined for God to, to take it away and now he implored, he desperately begged, desperately begged for God to help him. This didn't happen overnight. That's something that we read through here and it's sort of an interlining message. But David carried his sin, most believe, for over a year. Because he had sinned, he would committed adultery with Bathsheba, she was pregnant, they had a son. There, there was time that passed that David carried this along. And, and it, it wasn't a short amount of time. C.S. Lewis, uh, 50s and 60s, C.S. Lewis, he was an atheist and became a Christian and then wrote a bunch of good stuff. C.S. Lewis writes uh, about comparing, he compared repentance Turning from our sin and turning to God, he compared repentance to math. Math, one plus one equals two, math. A wrong sum, he writes, a wrong sum can be put right, but only by going back until you find the error and working it afresh from that point, never by simply going on. You can turn from your sin, but you've got to go back and restore the relationship that was broken. You can turn, but the relationship is still broken. You can't complete the equation until you go back and fix what's broken, get that right, and then the, then the mistake will be right too. So repentance begins when we personalize our sin and, and we feel like we're sorry over it. Remember what David said? In my transgressions. My sin, my iniquity. In transgressions, he willfully defied God. He knew that it was iniquity. It was perverse. It was vile. And he knew he was guilty of it. He knew it was my sin. Forgive my sin. I know I'm guilty, he says. I know I'm guilty. I'm not hiding anything. We'll start, we will start hating our sin once we see what it does to our relationship with God. <sighs> and the commentator continues, and it's just as sharp. We will never turn from a sin we do not hate. Every sin we have committed is because we love something else more than we loved God. <laughs> I know. Welcome to church. We sin because we love something else more than we loved God. And I am convicted by that. And it's hard to say and it's harder to hear. But it's nonetheless true. David didn't go to bed one night as the absolute perfect king, the giant slayer, the Goliath slayer. He was everybody's friend. He didn't go to bed one night as the perfect king and wake up as guilty of adultery. It happened a little bit at a time. 
little by little, bit by bit, the beginning of, of David's story in Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11 talks about when the kings normally go out to war. Well, David would have normally went out to war. He stayed behind. He stayed in the palace. He had time on his hands. He wasn't with his guys. His guys were noble and valiant and fighters, but he didn't go with them. Things had changed. He had slipped away little by little, and that's just what sin does. That's just what it does to us. We sin step by step, little by little, smaller to greater, just a little bit at a time. It's almost C.S. Lewis would write, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gradual slope with no signs, no sharp turns. That's what C.S. Lewis writes is the safest road to hell. Yeah, sounds right. We miss church. We get wrapped up in a pandemic. We miss Sunday school or we just stop going. We don't want to go to Bible school study anymore you know it's just easier to stay home it's easier isn't it chad just to stay home and you had a hard day at work it's like you know man it's seven o'clock at night i'm dead i got one more thing to do i don't know that i want to go and you miss one and it's easier to mix the next and it's easier to miss the next and the next and the next which just it's a gradual slope away turning from sin if if repentance was all there was to turning from sin not only we couldn't do it but we wouldn't do it that's raw, isn't it? We couldn't do it and we wouldn't do it. It's too powerful. It's in us, remember? It's in us. We're infected with it. We can't get away from it. Remember what the Apostle Paul says? I don't do the stuff I want to do. I do the things I don't want to do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I do. That's the Apostle Paul talking. And if he's talking like that, I better be talking like that because I'm not near as noble as he is. So, oh, wow. How do we get away? Well, a couple things. Repentance is not feeling sorry for ourselves. That's the devil's trick. Oh, you're worthless. You just shouldn't even go to church. Well, the roof's going to fall in if you go. I mean, you, they don't want you there. Why would you go there? They're all, look, they're all judging you anyway. <laughs> Repentance is not feeling sorry for yourself. It's not that at all. Judas felt sorry for himself. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, he felt sorry for himself, but he didn't repent. He didn't change his mind. He felt so sorry for himself, he hung himself, one of the Gospels say. But he didn't repent. Repentance will produce changes in our lives after we see what our sins are doing to us. After we see what our sins are doing to our relationship with God. Then, then we'll see that, oh, we're, we're broken. We need, to, we need to change. We need to move direction. We need to go back, the, back in the math equation and get it right, and then we can get this right. And then things will be right again, but not until we turn and not until we go back. Okay, listen. In Acts 3.19, so repent, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, regret past sins, and return to God. Seek his purpose for your life so that your sins will be wiped away, blotted out, completely erased, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So many that I talk to are desperate for this time of refreshing not just because of the pandemic, but just because of sin in general and life in general and the erosion in general. They're tired of that. Anyone who has battled any type of addiction, I know some of your stories, I don't know a lot of your stories, but anybody who has battled any type of addiction, I, ho I hope Steve's listening today that because he's worked with many who've done that, know that the first step is admitting that we cannot fix ourselves. That's the first step. You can pick any, any category. I wrote a few down from AA. But we admitted we were powerless. This is the first steps of addiction. Admitted we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives were unmanageable. We had to admit that. We came to believe that only a power greater than ourselves could restore us, could restore us to sanity, could restore us to our relationship with God. And we made a decision to turn our will and our lives into the, over to the care of a God, because God's the only one more powerful, as we understood him. That's the first one. You look up Alcoholics Anonymous, Sex Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. Those are all going to be very close to the first steps in all of those because it's nonetheless true. It all makes sense that way. One of the commentators, I love this. We need a greater love to drive out our love of sin, and there's no greater love than God's love. 
There's no greater love than God's love to drive out that, that sin that we're struggling with or battled with or tripped over. And it says, sin clouds our vision and repentance cleans the window, this commentator says. It's like, wow, that's, that's perfect. Paul in Romans, the same book that he said, I don't do the things I want to do. Paul writes in Romans 2, because of your callousness, stubbornness, and unrepentant heart, you are deliberately storing up wrath for yourself on the day, of, on the day when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. We can't we can deny our sin and we can beat ourselves up because I'm a really good one at that. I beat myself up over sin expert level. So we're really good at that. But if we just believe the gospel and accept that Jesus came to die for those sins, it's a fresh gulp of air. We're not underwater anymore. We can start seeing things with new eyes. This cleaning the window analogy fits really good there because when we're in sin and we're working or we're working with somebody who's dealing with sin, that's just what it looks like. It's like you're just not seeing things clearly. You're not seeing things as they really are. Your, your vision has been distorted in some way or limited in some way. Genuine, genuine repentance will always bring us closer to God. Hear that. Genuine repentance will always bring us closer to God. Always. In Isaiah 30, Old Testament, Isaiah 30, 15, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Matthew 5, Jesus talking, change your heart and lives because the kingdom of heaven is near. Luke 5, I have not come to, to heal the, the well, but for the sick. It's the sick who need a doctor, not the well. I've come for them. I have not come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. Godly grief will always produce this repentance because we're sad. We're sad that we've drifted from God and we want to restore that. Our life is broken and we, we found, we've looked here and here and here and here and here and here and here for whatever the world has to offer and we're just as broken, if not more so after that. So we get to this end of the road and say, okay, you got me. You got me. There's tons of testimonies that sound like that. God, come into my heart. Come into my life. It is by grace. I love that scripture Sheila wrote, uh, read during the music. Ephesians 2.8. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. When Adam and Eve sinned, God came to them. If you read the story in Genesis, Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit of the tree. They weren't supposed to. They had all the other trees, but they didn't want those other trees. They wanted the white one. So they eat. God came to them. God sought them out. Where are you? What are you doing? Why are you hiding? Who told you you were naked? God is the one who made animal skins into clothes for Adam and Eve. God called to Abraham at home. God called to Moses from a bush. God called to the prophets in words and visions. God set the prophet Nathan to King David. Jesus sought out the disciples. Jesus sought out the apostle Paul. No matter whom you are or where you are or what you've done, this fill in the blank, God pursues us. God pursues us. He will pursue you until the very last moment. He will pursue you and pursue all of his loved ones to the very last moment for salvation if you haven't come there yet. He will never, ever, 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 ever stop pursuing you just like any of you parents could ever stop pursuing your children. You'll never stop, ever, until they come back. Luke 15.10. I'm just going to close with these scriptures. Luke 15, 10. I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That is, changes his inner self, his old way of thinking, regrets past sins, lives his life in a way that proves repentance and seeks God, per, God's purpose for his or her life. Luke 15, the prodigal son. While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt sorry for his son. So the father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. My son was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. That is exactly what God is looking at when we're looking to come back. He is waiting for us to take one movement, one moment towards him so that he can reach out his arms and run to us and hug him and hug us and kiss us because we're thinking, oh, I've done wrong. I've been bad. I can't ever turn around. If we sincerely re re repent of our sins, God is faithful to forgive us 100% of the time. God's not a liar, and it says it right in his word. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. I'm going to read this word for word. 
If we say that we have no sin, refusing to admit that we are sinners, we delude ourselves and the truth is not in us. His word does not live in our hearts. If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just, true to his own nature and promises. He will forgive our sins and cleanse us continually from all unrighteousness, our wrongdoing, everything not in conformity with his will and purpose. Amen. Amen. Those three points. If you missed one, the first one was infected. Having a sinful nature is not something we can avoid or grow out of. Inclined in God's eyes, the only acceptable payment for any and all sin is the death of the sinner and implored. No matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, God pursues us. God pursues you. Okay. I, I often, often try to close with a, with a few words as the as the folks of the girls come up to sing one of the commentators and I almost didn't put it in there it's you know God is he seeks out that broken heart that crushed spirit a contrite heart is a crushed spirit a broken spirit is one that's broken over our sins and it says God will never abandon that God will never ignore that heart that's broken and crying out for him I don't know what that message said to you. I prayed that it was clear. I pray that it was accurate. I've tried my, my best. And if God has spoken to your heart, I would invite you to speak to Him. Amen. The steps, the altar is open. If, if you desire to come forward and kneel at the front, it is open for you and God is waiting for you. I would invite you to pray this turning back, this imploring, this seeking out for God to restore your relationship with Him or to begin your relationship with Him. So please, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You for the ones that have come up to sing. Thank You for so many who help the church and the church service and the duties of this building that are many more than most would realize. Thank you so much for your word and your words. And now, Lord, I pray. I pray that you touch those who you are crying out to. That you would open up our eyes and ears and heart to accept exactly what you have to say. That the evil one would be hushed when he says that everybody's going to judge us or look at us wrong. And the relationships with human beings are going to come and go, but our relationship with you is either going to be forever or be lost forever after this life. It's not an accident that those who are listening online will hear this message. It's certainly not an accident that those who are in this room this day, <laughs> you knew. You knew exactly who would be here and exactly who would listen and exactly what would be spoken. And Lord, we ask, as always, for your word and your words to be heard and acted upon. That they would say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done and thought. I'm sorry for the way that I've lived. Lord, I believe that you sent Jesus. Christmas is coming, but I believe even more than that, that he came as a baby, that he lived and taught, and that he died for me. He died for my sins. He died for what I would do 2,000 years later. All of those sins that he died for that moment on that cross were sins that hadn't happened yet because I hadn't been born yet. And Lord, I believe that he died and that he paid for those sins for all that who would accept him. So Lord, I'm asking you to come into my heart and my life because life isn't as I want it to be and my sins are suffocating me. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final hymn.
song too. (laughs) Let's let's go out in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and your words. Thank you for the opportunity and the ability to be here. Thank you for hearing those prayers, spoken and unspoken. And now, Lord, I ask that you would send us out, that you would send us out refreshed, renewed, (laughs) re-energized by your word and your words, by your life and your light, and that, Lord, you would help us to reflect you well until we meet again. Lord, send us out with your word, your words that say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Father, be with each and every one who lacks that peace this day. And may we reflect that peace to all who lack it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.